Today's guest is a global credibility expert, Mitchell Levy. Mitchell leads the Credibility Nation. So it's a special treat to welcome him to the Experience Nation. Mitchell is a TED speaker, international bestseller of over 60 books. He created dozens of businesses in the Valley, including four publishing companies that had published over 850 books. Very relevant for our, for our audience, you know, our my personal ambition of reimagining the book. Mitchell has also provided strategic consulting to hundreds of companies, has been a chair of a NASDAQ listed company, is a Marshall Goldsmith, you know, one of the top 100 coaches in that organization. And in general, um, a very, very interesting and thoughtful person on all things about credibility and clarity. Welcome to the pod. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, th speaking of the word thank you, I will begin with one of the quotes, Mitchell, that was comes from your book, Thank You, saying thank you in 140 languages, uh, that I love, and it's just a great reminder, thank you is more than a phrase. It is responsibility to pass on the love received. Another great time. Uh, another great time to say the phrase is when someone pays us a compliment. When in doubt, just say thank you. Do not worry about showing too much gratitude to the people around you. There is no downside to that. Amen, Mitchell. Mm. This is um, the the world that we live in is kind of a, oftentimes feel like negative. People are complaining or like profoundly unhappy, and the the ability to have, you know, to have the simplicity of just getting down to the essence of like these these simple things that we sometimes forget to do, of just saying thank you, right? Like saying thank you from people at work to a colleague that's well done. And I have to say, I could learn this and I kind of often try to remind myself because it doesn't come naturally, right? Like it's like, hey, I should say thank you. This person worked pretty hard on something. And even if the outcome is, eh, you know, I, I it's better to start with a thank you. What's your take on, you know, being intellectually honest and and highlighting what um, what's really going on for you, right? Because nothing is always perfect. And keeping this attitude of gratitude in in their important relationships in our lives yeah there's so much in that it, there's so much in that question thank you um oh i just slipped thank it you. in that was accidental <laughs> i didn't do that We're on gonna... purpose um the you know what's interesting is the there's a difference between happiness and joy okay happiness is what's on the outside joy is what's on the inside and if you have people working with you, not for mm. you, when you have people working with you, the interesting thing is how do you how do you sort of pull out their joy? How do you make sure they're doing what they want to do and then and are appreciated for it and motivated to do more? Mm. Something as simple as a thank you or complimenting, even if you had constructive things to focus on. By the way, this is also, I'm saying this is also a good reminder for me. We 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 always sometimes uh, many of us, I do, fall into the negative trap of, ah, that doesn't work. I always try my best to start with, I love what you did here. So right. thank so you. So you find a specific, real, authentic way to acknowledge a part of what something has done. Now, you first. said something very clear, specific, real, authentic, right? Yes, you don't do it just because... To it's do a it, shit do sandwich where you have to do yeah. thank you, shit, thank you. You actually find specificity in the thank you to be real. Okay, good. That makes that makes sense. Now let's remember to execute that. So you find that initial of authenticity. And how do you do you ever worry about like so do you worry about that? Follow up, which is the opposite of thank you, which is like here is the next area of improvement. You know, I think what happens, different people. Yeah, go ahead. Well, here's what's something that happened as soon as you and I started talking. Yeah, I started feeling your energy because part of it. I also watched your video series ahead of time, which, by the way, you guys you did a great job. There's a 
if if even if you don't go on Alex, Alex's show, if you just go and watch the five prep videos, that's powerful. Oh what I God, felt energy you. there and what I feel energy now is this is somebody who's authentically wanting to be of service to their audience. Right. So if you said to me, as a matter of fact, uh, I'll give you an example. After we were talking, uh, what happened, I moved my seat a little bit closer so you and I could be at the same level. And you were a little bit too close to the camera. And when I share that with you, you didn't, you did, you know, you weren't offended. I, I shared it in such a way was, which is, by the way, just so that we could be similar. I mm. wanted to share that with you. Mm. And that was me technically giving you constructive criticism, but it was not done in a negative. It was done in, hey, it would be a better show for those who are watching us. If God, we yeah, if we yeah. are if we're close aligned. enough or similar aligned on the camera. Yeah. And I think staring me that close in the face like that, the way I was, or was it like that? That's not a pleasant <laughs> experience for anyone. So you say you rescued the audience. Let's hear it from Mitchell. <laughs> so um, so good. We're role playing already. And this is going to be a very special episode because A, I've um read your work i've read marshall goldsmith's work and you're doing some really amazing work on clarity in particular which we'll come back to in a little bit but let's kind of dive into the broader topic of credibility right the the theme that we discussed before the call that worries me about silicon valley tech startup culture our words along the lines of, or advice along the lines of fake it till you make it. Uh, uh, just kind of throw some, throw some shit against the wall and see what sticks for lack of a, you know, or spaghetti, but it's mostly that kind of culture. There is a bit of a non Silicon Valley world, which we see a lot of relate to. There is a bunch of, people that say i'm a quote unquote sustainability expert and then show up with a 80 page printout that killed two trees you know while talking about digital sustainability oh, initiatives that, that, by the way like gpt that. probably created for them so yeah, right the, the, right like so so they're kind of they're being incongruent between the, the messages that they say as a, as a consultant you know you could Kind of always feel really sad when consultants start teaching you about innovation because that's just really not necessarily the the path of of a typical kind of management consultant uh, is to be going down the direction of innovation and there are exceptions and that has changed but in general like if you're showing up talking about innovation or digital transformation with a very conventional approach you immediately lose credibility and trust so I want to kind of dig into the the faking of credibility right or incongruencies you've talked to 500 people that are experts at this what are some of the most common mistakes that people make or in incongruencies that have them lose credibility so oh anyone who says the word and they're telling you to fake it till you make it is someone you, you want to run away from Period. Right? It's so hard for me to bite my teeth. Well, maybe not run away from you want to politely let them know that that's one of the most uncredible things I call the opposite of credible dubious. One of the most dubious things you could do is to, to actually fake it till you make it because you're being inauthentic. You're not being of service to your customer base. Right. So if somebody says that you could actually come back with the words, well, isn't it inauthentic? To fake it till you make it. Listen to the response. If their job, if, if if they want to sell you something, they want to keep you on that path, they're they're not credible. If they're not coachable, they're not credible. If they're not coachable, it's somebody who you don't want to interact with. Mm. So if there's something you let's say there's an area, a passion you're excited about and you want to learn, you want to grow, and you really don't have a lot of experience in it. Um if people say fake it till you make it, no, that's stupid. 
what you could do is you go to somebody who who trusts you, who already knows you, who already likes you. And you can say, hey, listen, I'd like to try this experiment. I'm working on this area. Do you mind if we that you give me an opportunity to do this? You can either do it for free, do it for a dollar or a small amount, and let them know that, hey, I'm going to work really hard to make this work, but I haven't done this before. My That's exactly, thing. I love this. I love this phrase because I think you're reframing it exactly the way we think the customer development should be happening. Hey, we are new to this. We will work hard to figure this out together. If you're interested in that type of partnership, being an early partner, would love to figure this out together. That's like, that's going to be way better than faking it and saying, Hey, I'm an expert in this oh. and I've done this and I have that. Oh, Alex, I'm, I, I'm doing that right now. I'm, I'm um, 13 weeks into a certified clarity specialist program. And the people in the program, I said, listen, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to give you as much time and energy as I can so that we've made this, by the way, I don't think we should ever press an easy button. I don't think they exist, but I'm going to press the simple button. Mm. And so the team that's working with me, we're about ready to convert from alpha to beta. I'm still in beta, but those people who come on, who trusted me, they trusted that I looked them in the eyes and I said, listen, I don't know the answer. I know where we're heading and we're going to go there together. And I'm going to spend all my energy to make sure you're successful. Yeah. Those people heard that. And, and, and I'm honored that I have their trust. Got it. So we got fake it till you make it. And then the opposite of that, right? Which is building trust by by saying, hey, this is where you are. And we could align directly. Second, any other any other kind of things that you see that are obvious things that were smart, capable people was actually valuable things to say and to bring to the world are stepping on their own shoes and you know falling off the ski slopes you know in a very painful way let me, let me give, i'll give you two yeah i'll give you two let's Simple. do it first let's go to the definition yeah. credibility is not a plaque on the wall credibility is the quality in which you are trusted known and liked okay so what's interesting about those areas is you can't be a jerk and be successful in to the today's world there's too much competition the trust shows that you can do what you do as people get to know you. It's not that they know of you. It's that they know who you are. They know that you're a servant leader. They know that you have the intent mm. and commitment to do the right thing. As I'm talking to you and I gave feedback before, I was uttering part of the 10 words or 10 values of credibility. Mm. We'll do the second one. The Actually, I take it back. There's three, but I'll do them quick. Uh, I'm adding a new second one. We've been told that we need to, to cast a wide net and serve everybody. Mm. And what I'll say is the more narrow you could focus the audience you serve, the easier it is for people to believe you and the better the opportunity that they're going to refer you to somebody else. Okay. Now let me do the third and we'll come back to the, to the second. The third is you need to make sure as people get to know you, they're going to want to see consistency with how you show up in person, whether in person, Zoom or or live in person, and how you show up asynchronously. How do you show up in social media and your websites? And if there's inconsistency between those areas, there's doubt put in place. There's dubiousness put in place. And so it's harder to be credible if you don't have a consistent view, uh, if people don't have a consistent view of, of who you are, who your company is, and how you serve all right so let's double click on that third one sure like i would call it incongruity right where you say one thing but you do something different through your behavior and in the today's world we can we had we had like at my company related we observe that through digital body language we could say hey people say that they will look at your proposal and they never show up Right. For example, that's actually a really interesting thing. And then you all of a sudden, hey, you're not the type of uh, deal that I want to pursue or the client that I want to pursue. Right. Or you have clients to whom you deliver your content. They don't they don't look at it. They send you to do more work. They don't give you the feedback. And you're like, hey, this is I'm, I'm spinning wheels here. So there's there's kind of accountability that gets built 
by having more digital transparency. Um, well, that's but actually I, just, I, what's, I'm yeah. going to point out your, the benefit of your company as I was diving into and learning more about yeah. it is that not only is there a comedy, accountability to do that, but you actually provide the accountability to be able to do business that way, which is kind of well, fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating because I think we need to, there, like you can't bullshit that much in face-to-face -face conversations, but I think you, you could bullshit a lot more asynchronously, I think. And so I think we are getting into a culture. I'm thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think, look, people spin up, people spin up a fake LinkedIn profile, for example, right? Mm. Or sp fake websites. That's easy to do, right? That that's not that doesn't cost a lot of money, but uh, stupid. If, if, but I got it. Do, but but it's doable, right? And but if you actually talk to to somebody in a in detail right if we have the privilege to talk to somebody in detail you could really uncover that the person doesn't know what the hell they're talking about right like and so that becomes pretty pretty obvious pretty quickly if you're discerning listener and participant in a conversation but in the digital realm i think our attention gets sparse and we we could kind of we scan things right like the way we read it we the way we consume content we scan and so people ah, okay and then what i think that creates a lot of noise and so the real trick to me it feels that you need to be able to show the high level easy to digest a clear message of what you're specialist in but that's not enough i would challenge uh and and i want to come back to that what you need to do is then be able to drill in and then people that want to drill in, they need to see, hey, there is substance underneath that. Real evidence of actually somebody does what they do, says what they um, say they will do, et cetera. That you can either build that over time or you could have a digital site that allows you to do that. And I think we find that in the industries that require evidence, like life sciences, where you do have those PhDs was expert titles, you do need to provide that that element of credibility, even though people are overloaded, they don't have time to process but, alone. But Alex, that it, depending on who you are and how you show up, that that level of credibility is very simple. That's done through social proof. That's easy. You know, for me, I have. Now, uh, over 500, probably close to 750 video testimonials of people who have who have given feedback and what I've been able to, to do with them. I, I can't show all those on my website. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That's the level of social proof you're talking about. But let me let, let's go back to let's start with the most simple element of credibility. OK, most simple element of credibility really is clarity. And that is, in less than 10 words, can you articulate the playground you play in? And I use the word playground specifically, because if you don't love what you do, you should be doing something else. There's so much opportunity in the world to do that. So so if you love what you do- Amen. Work is more fun than fun. It depends on what you define as work and fun, but we'll say, okay, yeah. in yeah. your definition. For me, I- it's there's not a work life balance. There's just a life balance. Yeah. I happen to do some stuff that people call work that I make money, and I do other stuff which is fun, you know. And 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 I I like both, right? So the thing that's interesting in the playground you play in is in ten words or less, can you articulate with with clarity with simplicity that audience you serve, right? And if you can do that, I call that the C pop, your customer point of possibilities, and what comes next is to tell me more. So what's interesting to me, Alex, is that your CPOP will be consistent. Your tell me more will change based on the audience. If you're speaking to a marketing audience, you're going to probably throw in some marketing terms. If you're speaking to your investors, you're going to talk from an investor perspective. If you're speaking to clients, you're going to speak from the client perspective, right? So the tell me more is about a minute. And it reinforces the CPOP for the person you're talking with. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we, before right? the call, you 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 hinted that you wanna you wanna put me on a on a cold call and 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 test test out if we can do this clarity 
um, process that you work on with your clients. And I raised my hand because I, I'm full of ideas, very excited to communicate. And I think there's way more ideas that are coming out than clarity about specific ones. So I would say guilty as charged. I love your advice on what we can do better. And I'm, I'm wondering whether we do it for the podcast or more for, for my, my own company relate to probably relate to is more is, is more defined. It uh, makes more sense to do it for the place where you're making money. Okay. Well, we're not right. officially we're confirmed here. We're not making any money with the podcast. It's a service to all those that want to create awesome experiences uh, at for at, at work, for employees, for customers, investors, you name it, and and for stu- increasingly for students and patients. So we are um, not making money here, and neither is Mitchell. Uh, but uh, but yeah, relate to. Uh, would be a great example. So, what what do you want me to to give a attempt to do the ten words, or how do you run this process? You're the boss here; it's your pod now. <laughs> so, um, we'll we'll go through the so just for those who are listening or watching. Yeah. Yep. The CPOP is the who. So, who do you serve? Typically, mm-hmm. one, two, three words, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll ask you questions, Alex. And the second part of it is from their perspective, what is the pain point you're addressing or what is the pleasure point you're helping them reach? Mm. So I'll give you an example of mine and then and then Alex, I'll ask you a question because I want you to be thinking about the who and the what. So for mine, coaches who've created a job, not a business. Eight words. And if I'm looking to somebody and I'm talking to them, I'm seeing right away whether or not they fall into one, two, or three categories. First category, are they potential referral for me? Second category, are they a prospect? Third category, they don't care. Now, it doesn't mean they don't care about me. It just means they don't care about those 10 words. Uh, In this case, my eight words. If they're in the first two categories, they're going to say, tell me more. And if I said the tell me more, I would basically say, Coaches, there are so many of them, and there's so many certification programs, and they have all these degrees and methodologies and approaches to deliver. And they're really good at delivering. But what they're not good at, they kind of suck at business development. So I have a program that helps combine not only getting clarity for them, helping them give clarity to their clients, but a business development system that gives them business on an ongoing basis. Notice when I shared my tell me more, which was less than a minute, I was sharing it from the container of the playground I play. So I'm Mm. already listening. I'm already sharing from a container of credibility, from a container of of trust, because you're like, oh, I know somebody like that. Mitchell, I might want to recommend somebody like that to you. Mm. So anyway, that's the process. Wow. Well, I got the so funny. The the I'll, I'll raise my hand in, in human nature. As you were saying the first part, I started immediately playing through my head what I would say, which is kind of embarrassing. I lost a little bit track of the 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 the, the follow up questions. But it, shall we give it a go? Like, was that sure. least who 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 is it? Who is who do you serve? Who is your primary audience? Creators and communicators whose content doesn't reach their audience. Okay. So that's what you'd like to say. And that's actually not a bad CPOP. Um, Tell me about what is a creator and a communicator. So in the business world, and we could, we could split into different varieties, but in the business world, it's typically somebody who creates a PowerPoint or or document. And a communicator is somebody who's who either presents presents that or sends it over, you know, sends it over to a customer, a potential customer, employee. Right. So I, I would distinguish between sometimes they are the same person, uh, and oftentimes they are not. A creator could be a designer a kind of a mar- marketer that creates a piece of collateral that then the salesperson delivers to the customer.
Interesting. And and what is it that what is it that they need to communicate that's not reaching their audience? What's what is it? What are they well doing? in the in business? What are you what are, what's the how do you what what tool do you use to write your books? No, oh, it it always depends, but at the end of the day, we're in some form of we're, Google we end Doc up or Word. Word. Yeah. yeah, Google Doc or Word. So that's that's the one of the common tools, right? Another one is PowerPoint. And then the, for the communication, typically people take um, the presentation, the Word doc, and save it as a PDF, right? In the case of a book, they, you may kind of actually use the PDF to print the book. But in general, those are that's the toolkit of a typical business communicator. And then increasingly now, of course, there's multimedia, video, audio uh, that people add in. But interestingly, some of the most important communications, important messages are the ones that are presented in the worst possible way, which is, you know, st st put the ideas in a Word doc and then save it as a PDF and hope that people will consume it on a screen. And I think that that hope is where the disconnect is, right? Because on the screen, we actually are not used to consuming anymore the documents that are kind of traditionally presented. We're, cons we're, we're, we're great at consuming videos, scrolling through blogs maybe, but we're, we're not as deeply engaging with uh, long form content on a screen as we would like. And that that is a big opportunity that we help those communicators to really get those ideas across to their desired audience. So the pain is what? I heard it in there, but I was pulling it out. Tell me what the pain point is. Waste. You, you work hard on something that's really valuable. And and nobody nobody really engages with it. You don't get any feedback on it. Uh, it doesn't move your audience forward. Ooh, that's interesting. <clears throat> uh, deep dive into that for a little bit. The engagement part. What does that mean from your perspective? So so there's three modes of engagement that we see. First, where I choose the adventure that I go on when i'm consuming your content so i pick hey i want to go to this chapter or i, I go to have an interactive menu of some sort that takes me to the areas that i want to consume when i go into those areas i have a high level overview uh, so it's not overwhelming it's not like a wall of information that i can't process but then i can drill in and so drilling in could be, a, 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 you know, I have a high level summary, but then I can watch a detailed video or I actually drill into a detailed document for the area that I really care about, because then I'm motivated to consume it. And then the third piece is as I'm drilling in and I'm consuming this supporting relevant content, I stay inside the experience, right? So I think typically if you click on a, a YouTube video and inside a PDF, what's going to happen Mitchell, you're going to leave to and right. go on YouTube and then God knows what happens there, right? Like you could you be never get that. immersed right. in the w political debate of the day, the war in Ukraine, all things that don't relate to the message of the person that sent you over into YouTube. So it's really important that we keep you in, inside the thought leadership experience or the communication experience that you want that person to have. And you continue to engage more, richer, deeper. So it's sort of a safe environment that, that you've created. So that's what we mean by engagement. And the ultimate goal of that engagement is to move forward, right? So the watching a video per se may not be the, the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to follow up, sign up to, to book, to have a meeting or, or go to whatever is the right next step for the author believes what's the single most important thing that a person should do at the end of reading that book. And it's a tragedy that most presentations don't even think about that. And even if they do think about it somewhere in the last page, unclickable, undo, like on un anything, you know, where is it like in common digital mode today? That should be I don't know, a persistent call to action that's obvious, you know, relatively quickly to the user. So what's the one thing they need to do after consuming this content? Does that make sense? So it's sort of navigation, immersive experience, like moving towards a call to action that hopefully you've earned uh, that's obvious and clear what's the next step. Those are the components of engagement that we see. 
Ooh. So what's the importance of the CTA at the end? It depends on the industry. So if you're a marketer, a CTA is a uh, is an ebook. Every every marketer has this idea that okay, I'm gonna get a gated lead, right? I'm gonna put them through some you know get get somebody's name, then they'll download the ebook, and then our sales team will follow up and schedule an appointment with them, right? That's kind of the classical Silicon Valley B two B marketing playbook that you see all day long. There's a few problems with that, right? In, in that concrete example. Number one, if you pull in, fill in your details, most likely you're not even, you're going to be getting an email somewhere that will likely be caught in spam with a link to the download of that um, ebook. So high probability, you'll never even get to that email. If you get to that email, you will, if you click on it, you'll be taking out of your email experience into a PDF that is typically not designed for consumption on the screen, as we discussed, doesn't have navigation, doesn't have rich experience, and doesn't have a call to action. And what's the call to action is book a meeting with a sales rep. Instead, you get bombarded by a bunch of spammy sequences, you know, from reps or from marketing. Hey, learn more. Hey, follow up. Here's this. At that point, you may have already lost your interest, right? Like you had an yep. interest yep. when you were filling out the form. So the CTA is like at the moment when you're most engaged, right? What are you going to do, right? Because I then you're it. gone, right? We get lost in the noise. So I had it early on, but I wanted to add a couple more questions because the, the problem with somebody who is extremely bright like you is that you thank you, you had a <laughs> i'll take that like, like you um <laughs> is that you had a lot of really different points that all made sense but there were a number of different paths one can go yeah so i've created two um one and these are all things that you said and i was just in the incremental questions i was reinforcing how to present it i created one which was a pain point um for you and i created one which was a pleasure point so let me mm. share both and we'll see which one you like better. I'm going to share it. I'm a visual. So I'm going to share it in chat and then I'll read it to you. Okay. So CPOP stands for customer point of possibilities. Now, you started off by saying communicators and creators. Um, I'm going to pick just one. I'm going to say communicators. Uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about yet, I'll just say that with GPT, thought leadership is now ubiquitous. Um, I'll I'll take it another step. Being a creator is now ubiquitous. If you have the right prompts to the right AI, you can create whatever you want. So I'm going to drop the word creator from mm. your from your thought and just go with communicators. Okay. And so the first one, the pain point one, communicators with non engageable content. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't like it as much as this the pleasure one, and I'm going to lean towards pleasure. But it's an interesting word because not engageable is not a common word. Like I've been talking about engaging, well, you know, content. I've never be, come up with that. It's I like it. It sort of interrupts you. <laughs> you should use not, and that's by the way. What's nice about a C pop is when somebody says, "What do you mean by non engageable?" Yeah. You could do non consumable, right? Yeah. If you wanted to do that, right? It's all you care about is not changing the words once you settle on it. You A, does it feel good to you? And B, is the person one or two? Are they a potential referral partner? Or are they a potential client? Right? Because yeah. they're going to say, tell me more. Yeah. The second one, which is interesting, is communicators creating action with their content. Yeah. And that's really, that. so So what happens yeah. on that? So you like that one better, I could tell. Well, um, I think it's just more, we're positive and I can go talk about negative stuff all day long, as you heard me describe. I think it's like a tragedy, but I think there is something affirming, creating action with your well, ideas, creating impact with your ideas. Right? Given who you are, it makes more sense. And if you don't mind, Alex, yeah. let me share your CPOP and your tell me more, just based on this conversation. And it's recorded, so you can go back to it. The CPOP, you always want to remember that tell me more will be different based on the audience. And if you're listening or watching, tell me how this feels to you, All right? So if you said what's your CPOP or what do you do, 
client, I typically would say something like clients typically attracted to us and I'll do mm. a pause. So clients typically attracted to us, communicators creating action with their content. All right. In today's world, anyone can create content. As a matter of fact, many communicators are creating non-engageable content that is just sitting out there and you don't know what people are following through with it. What we do is we help facilitate communicators creating the type of content that's robust, that gets the energy, that is attracted to however somebody processes information, kinesthetically, visually, orally. And we keep track of that for the communicator so they actually see how their contact, how their content is impacting the audience. And that would drop it like there. Boom, mic drop. And that's that's the mic can, drop. Can, uh, can, you, can you join our advisory board and relate to <laughs> effective <laughs> immediately? <laughs> uh, yes, just send me the paperwork. Um, <laughs> the p- power of having, I'm going to say what I said before, but now you now have experienced it. The power of having a CPOP is you now know the playground you play in. Mm. I often ask people to, hey, when they wake up in the morning, does does the words communicate or creating action with their content? Is that what flows off the top of your head? If it does, now this is the downside. You're going to look at how you show up asynchronously and you go, oh my God, we need to change stuff. Because what you want to do is empower and reinforce both synchronously and asynchronously that those words, one, two, three, four, five, six, six words. That's the playground you play in. And everything you do stems from that playground. And now, if you talk to investors from that playground, you would say different things than if you talk to marketers versus if you talk to your prospects. Hey, so let me ask you a very specific challenge. Maybe it's relevant to us, but I think it's a global challenge for technology-driven businesses. We've taken an approach at Relate to is very broad, right? Like we saw a particular problem at the beginning around PDFs. We saw like, hey, PDF is sort of this fossil from the analog paper era, yet we're using it in our digital screens. This makes no sense. Can we help people? But it's still easy to create, easy to share. So can we help people transform this? The problem turned out that PDFs are really used everywhere across everything. We, like we have 10,000 page books and one page infographics, right? Presentations and, you know, scrollable microsites that kind of all come out of a PDF transformation as an example. And so as a result, you have marketers, you have sellers and you have, you know, educators or different personas that are using it. And we've, the word like the word communicators, right. That we've used in this case, it's, a a generic abstract word. And it may not, a person may not be connecting to it. If I said marketers that want to create content that drives actions, sorry, I'm messing up the seep up already as we speak, but you sort of, if I, if I personalized it, if I personalized it specifically to marketer, right. And, and then in the, a VC that you would talk to say, which kind of marketer? Oh, B2B marketers with, oh, you know, so Alex, 100 I, to 2,000 I, employees gonna, located gonna, in Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah, exactly. That's what you, you need to say for the VCs. What's yeah. interesting to me is the if we decide that this is your CPOP, you don't need to change the, the CPOP. What you need to do is you may have taglines that stem from your CPOP. Right. Right. You know, the space you play in your taglines are the marketing things. Right. So you're going to have taglines that are focused on different audiences. You'll have tell me more is that focus on different audiences. Deep down, though, the people inside your company need to know the playground they play in. Yeah. In a bigger yeah. picture, that's the playground they play in. And I think the, the, the sort of universality, I actually loved another one of your quotes. And I want to bring it up, um, pulling out of this a little bit, but I think it's it's really related. Uh, in a book called um, "Turning Ideas into Impact: Insights from Sixteen Silicon Valley Consultants," your your team of writers wrote alignment and employee engagement around a shared understanding of the customer can be a corporate superpower. 
driving higher profits, customer satisfaction, and employee retention. And it sounds like a few buzzwords brought together, but actually it's brilliant in the way where it brings it together. Because the, what you just because what you just said, right? Alignment around the customer. And sometimes people are going, "Well, we align around our mission, and we align around that, and we align. We're like we're going to change You're the all world, about the blah, people blah, blah. who are your customers yeah. today and tomorrow's customers. Who do yeah. you serve? Maybe and it's just so simple. But but you do people. need the alignment. You need that right? Like that's yeah. yeah. And it is, by the is, way, thanks so, for that quote. I, you know, it's so it's so funny. I, I, yes, I wrote that at some point in time and um, powerful. <laughs> Thank you. It's super powerful because it's so hard to know where do you start. Some people say, well, we start with our team and that's it, right? Like, and they all take care of the customer. But if the team doesn't know who the customer is and what they care about, they can't, they won't be that motivated, right? It becomes like a little navel gazing exercise. You know, that you see some some companies, they kind of get self-absorbed in their like little culture building. And if the culture goes around the customer, right, you then then the culture building, the alignment makes a ton of sense because it connects ultimately to that. So I, I and, and if you're your all customer and you don't care about your team, that also doesn't work, right? Because they wouldn't be able to serve them. Um, so yeah, it's it's tricky, but you got it. Thank you. I like it. I like it. Thank you for so, doing the research. I'm I'm well, honored. Well, and this this I need to celebrate. I, I as well was my amazing team who's supporting me because I can't take credit for that. I am I am backed by amazing team. Thank you for driving alignment with our customers and our community. Now, so oh, oh, by um, the way, let me. Can I? I'll just share one thing. There are two things you did which were powerful. Yeah. Right. Um, and these are two ways to be likable in terms of credible. And you just demonstrated two of them in the last two minutes. One is you showed me re respect by actually doing research ahead of time. So that's, you know, in terms of being likable, there are two values, showing respect. Typically means coming early, coming prepared, coming with your heart. I came in, you know, close to 10 minutes early on the interview because it feels like I need to show respect to you. The second is, I call it spreading cred dust. Hmm. So it's spreading the ideas, thoughts, and actions of others. Hmm. So it's the fact that your team did the work and you thank them publicly is hmm. how you should be as a CEO, not take credit for other things. Wow. I, we, you know, we, the, this is true. We tried to live up to it. Actually, we have run, for example, an internpreneur program, which is people that, run through and they're no longer part of the team. And I take a point and I think it's really, I kind of love it because they're great people. They they took a bet on us when we were a startup. They didn't know what we were doing and kind of did a lot of experiments. And I thank them sometimes in our public team meetings because I nice. ultimately believe, right? If you were doing something worthwhile, it's sort of a legacy. You stand on the shoulders of people that have been, been there before you, right? Like, and we're, and we, as a, we are related to, we stand on the shoulders of people that have done, like you talk about social proof, you know, I don't think I would have been aware of what we're building had I not Cialdini, I read Cialdini at some point and understood He's what amazing. social proof right. was, right? And that I have to thank Stanford for, because they exposed us to these ideas and they made sure that we didn't abuse them, but thought about them in a good way. So the, the, the legacy of thanks is is incredible, and as a book writer, you probably, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about that. So, yeah, I I, I salute you, and I actually want to salute, in, in our case, the people that in, inspire us. And actually, a question for you: like, this is really hard to do because you could go on thanking people forever and ever, right? Like, in in, in fact, the whole history of human progress <laughs> more or less stands on on things we've gained from others. How, where do you draw the line? <laughs> <laughs> Mitchell, what's your what's your advice here? I think I need a little bit more clarity on the question. So I it's a very it's an open ended well, question. So it's an open ended like so we I, like in the book acknowledgement sections, right? Like you you there's typically a very long list of acknowledgements, and so you brought up the value of of bringing up uh, as as a 
as part of building credibility is kind of recognizing people who have helped. But there's not a like if you do that, you could spend the whole the whole time a lot of oh, doing yeah. it, right? Oh, like I it's a very it. long and distinguished list of people on whose shoulders we stand. And and actually, I, it's an interesting question, right? Because when you're recognizing somebody else, then you're not potentially recognizing another person that has helped. And so you just got me down that rabbit hole. Oh, I see it. Of like I who we're it. gonna hurt by not recognizing you know, potentially, right? Oh. And I don't I don't worry about it all day long. Don't be don't you know to be sure, but it's an interesting question. Got it. One of my one of my uh early on, one of my authors did something thanks to all my customers who invested the time in allowing me to be successful for them. And that as opposed to pointing out particular customers. Um, okay. But he then went on in specific thanks to, and then highlighted a couple of people. Um, as an example, when I, uh, here's a great example. My second TEDx was during COVID. And so when I was practicing, I did 30 of these Zoom calls where I had somebody actually listen to the TEDx and give me direct feedback. Mm. The everyone gave me amazing feedback. I mean, the end result was having a bunch of advocates who who said, hey, Mitchell, we this is they they wanted to share it because they helped contribute it to it. It just so happened that my 10th reviewer, guy by the name of Ted Lau, gave me something so valuable he impacted my life. And so I actually used his name in the TEDx. I don't feel that the other none of the other 29 said, hey Mitchell, how come you need you didn't use my name, right? Nobody right. said that. So it's um, not it's not okay, great. Hmm. Yeah. And this is the this is the second one. So we are losing our humanity. Um I actually seen the first TED, TEDx talk of yours from 2018. And yeah, the second one is called We're We're Losing Our Humanity and I'm tired of seeing it happen. And it's the really the 10 values yeah. associated with with credibility. So I can't I can't speak to that. I didn't get to the second one. But in the first one, I love this idea of aha, right? And you've written a series of books around kind of the notion of an aha. So for our audience who are entrepreneurial, who have a marketing DNA, a creator DNA, as you've heard, communicator DNA, what are some of the ahas that you want to leave them with? Mm. Let's say three. Right. And, and you could repeat we, some not, of the core themes that you've already covered, right? Oh, yeah, if yeah. Got and it, I'm not right? thinking about, I'm not thinking about, um, I, we got to wrap up shortly. So, but thank you for this time. And I'm, I'm so honored. And we'll, we'll have a follow up call too. I, I'm going to say the most important thing you could do in your life um, is, is sort of know who you are. Don't wait until your deathbed and say to yourself, I wish I'd done something else. Right. And so having the clarity of saying, this is who I am and this is how I serve mm. is probably the most important thing you could do. And then sharing that publicly so people can 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 bat, bathe in it if it's appropriate. Um, they could share you if that's appropriate. I, I think there's nothing more. So it's that clarity that. exercise, but for a human. So the clarity exercise for yourself. Yeah. Um Second is to recognize that the person on the opposite end of you, whether they're, you call them a customer or a prospect or whatever it is, or or a, um, a partner, a or they're human. <laughs> human. They're human. So the question becomes for you, how can you be of service? Yeah. Right? One of the, there are two core values. So I'll leave you the third. One core value is, is basically being a servant leader. And the 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 other core value I want to I want to highlight is being coachable, always being open to an opportunity to learn. No matter if that person looks like they have credibility and are superior to you, or ready. And for those who are on the radio, I'm doing the double quotes. Or they look like they're so far beneath you, you're not going to learn anything. You can learn, and as long as you're coachable, you're going to learn from everyone you interact with in one way or another. Hmm. This is really powerful, especially for the CEOs and folks that have to play the visionary, the leader kind of role to be able to have a gear switch 
we've you've heard people talk about the management by walking yeah. around the management yeah. from learning from from your for people two three four eight levels below you there's yeah. a lot of knowledge there that that you're going to interpret in a different way but you have to at least listen well I'll, I'll tell you on a very personal level since we're talking about you brought up the first know who you are so one of my roles is a parent and i'm i'm delighted to be a father to three kids and i have to say i'm learning quite a lot <laughs> from the kids uh, <laughs> which is not the thing that you think about when you don't haven't been a parent. I, I think I, I was not a deeply thoughtful expert on parenting. And what I realized is that kids help you grow up as an adult, <laughs> you know, not the other way around. Absolutely. And it's Absolutely. hard to be coachable with kids, right? But it's like, if anybody's going to teach you patience and, presence it's the you know a kid in the middle of a meltdown and it's being not a, dad, a work being a mom stuff. absolutely yeah. powerful so i i love that you've brought these universal values um and lessons and ahas uh to our audience because i think ultimately we believe that to create great experiences in your organization uh you need to create great human experiences and that that's universal Right. Like, you know, what, and I think what you've basically provided us is a roadmap for doing that. So Mitchell, thank you so much for the chat. How can people reach you? Uh, the easiest way is just go to my primary website. So it's MitchellLevy.com. So that's with three L's, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L-L-E-V-Y.com. Uh, there you could links to LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn often. Um, uh, we have a clarity booster session. You can see the stuff that we do. I'd love to have you join us for a 90 minute session, but it's, it's all at MitchellLevy.com. And if, if this is inspired enough that you need to make time on my calendar, you could also directly go from there to my calendar and book time. Well, I, I'm going to book a session if that's, <laughs> if that's an invite to this and this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Uh, thank you for my sharing pleasure. your wisdom. It's truly credible. Alex, I loved it. Thank you so much for having me.